And he took a group of men out to the supposed landing site when they took radiation readings and they also saw a bright light like a winking eye between the trees, like the witnesses had done on the first night. And Colonel Holt also saw other lights in the sky, apparently moving around, flashing multicolored lights and emitting beams. Now let's get our bearings first. Uh, this is the area we're talking about in East Anglia. RAF Woodbridge was one of a pair of US Air Force bases situated to the east of Ipswich. Then the other one to the north of it was RAF Bentwaters, and that was where the nukes are said to have been stored. And further east was the promontory of Orford Ness, which features in our story. And this is East Gate of Woodbridge, as it was back then, firmly locked against the Russian invasion. <laughs> Now, the TV reconstructions always show it as, as something far grander, but at that time, it was little more than a farm gate. And it was from just inside here that a couple of security guards on patrol saw what they thought was something coming down into the forest. And four of them went out through this gate into the forest to see if they could find anything. And while they were out there, they saw strange lights between the trees, and these lights were also seen again by a different group two nights later, and that's when they called out the Deputy Base Commander, Colonel Charles Holt. Now what makes this such a significant case is not just that the witnesses were military personnel, but that we've got documentary evidence of what happened. And that includes not only written documents, but also a real-time tape recording, which I'll come to later. And the first document is this memo written by Colonel Holt to our own Ministry of Defence. And as you can see, it's not actually that great. Uh, it consists of one page, three paragraphs, written two weeks after the events. So they obviously didn't think there was anything terribly urgent about it. And this memo was released in 1983 under the Freedom of Information Act in the United States. And it wasn't classified in any way. This is not a top secret document. And it was the release of this memo in 1983 that inspired this front page headline, The News of the World. UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. And I, I still think this is one of the great headlines of our time. It's right up there with World War II bomber found on moon, if you remember that one. Now, I can't go into all the details of the case, not least because the witnesses keep making new ones up, but I'm going to tell you what I regard as the five main points of the case one by one, and tell you what I found, and why I came to the conclusions that I did. And the five points are these. Number one, what was it that made the guards think that something had crashed into the forest? Two, what was the flashing light that seemed to move between the trees and out to sea? Three, what caused the landing marks and the tree damage? Four, were the radiation readings of any significance? And five, sorry, there's four, and five, what were the other lights seen by Colonel Holt on the night he was out there? Now, of course, I don't insist that you have to agree with my conclusions, but please bear in mind that what I'm going to tell you is based, wherever possible, on contemporary evidence. And where I'm giving my own opinion, I'll try to make that clear. So I hope that this presentation will give you a clearer idea of what actually happened, as told by the witnesses at the time, rather than what people now say happened 30 years later, which is often quite different. So the first point, what was it that seemed to drop into the forest? Well, to solve this, we first of all need to know the exact date and time of the incident. And one of the first things I discovered was that the local police had been called out on the night of the first sighting. So I wrote to them and got this reply, and it confirms that the date was December the 26th, which is not the date on Colonel Holt's memo. Holt's memo said the first sighting was around 3 a.m. on December the 27th, so he was a day out. Which is not surprising, because he didn't write his memo until two weeks after. He was working from memory even by that stage. So once I had the right date, I was able to go in search of an explanation for what they might have seen. Now, as David told you, I'm an amateur astronomer. I'm interested in the ways in which people misinterpret astronomical phenomena as UFOs. And I knew that a bright fireball which is a piece of natural debris from space burning up in the atmosphere, often gives the impression of something falling to ground nearby, even though it never actually reaches the ground. 
And here's an example of one from 1992. Now the one at Rendlesham wouldn't have lasted as long as this, but the overall appearance would have been much the same. And as you can see, it appears to be descending behind those trees. But in fact it isn't. It's much higher and further away than it looks. So with this in mind, I rang Dr. John Mason of the British Astronomical Association's meteor section and asked him if he had any records of a bright fireball at around that time, 3 a.m. on December the 26th. And he had obviously read the newspaper reports and put two and two together himself. And he said, yes, there was a bright fireball seen over southern England at 10 to 3 on the morning of December the 26th. And I still remember him saying this to me on the phone. I knew they'd got the date wrong. Referring to Colonel Hall's memo. He was that convinced about it. So here we had a known fireball that could have been the culprit for the initial sighting. But it always troubled me that there never seemed to be any independent sighting of this fireball from anyone else on the air bases. Now that was until last year, when who should come to the rescue but none other than dear old Linda Bolton Howe, bless her. Um, if you don't know who Linda Bolton Howe is, she's the kind of person who thinks of the film Men in Black as a documentary. <laughs> Now, she runs a podcast called Earth Files, and last year she interviewed a new witness who'd never spoken out before. And he's called Richard Bertolino, and he was a security guard at Bentwaters, the companion base to the north of Woodbridge. And this is what he described seeing. We saw what appeared to be a very bright falling star. It had a uh, blue, green luminescence, sparkle tail to it. Both are drawn, they looked at each other and go, wow. That was close. It looked like it was falling between the two bases. And all of a sudden, on the radio, someone started yelling, there's a UFO out here. <laughs> so he called it a very bright falling star. It was blue-green, it had a tail, and it appeared close. And this is an absolutely standard description of fireball. It was just like that video I showed you, only not lasting as long. And he goes on to say that people then started shouting about UFOs. So from this it seems to me, and this is where I say my opinion, but in my view it's pretty clear that it was this fireball that sparked off the whole case. So nothing came down in the forest. That's the first thing I want you to realise. Nothing came down. Although the security, security guards thought it did. And so when they went out there, they expected to find something, and find something they did. So, what was that flashing light that they saw low down between the trees when they went out into the forest? Now, the light between the trees was seen on more than one night. It was seen by the men who went into the forest on the first night. It was also seen by Colonel Holt two nights later. And I'll come to Colonel Holt's account later on. And there's anecdotal evidence that it was seen on the intervening night as well. Uh, and, and there are even stories that people kept going out for some nights afterwards and seeing it again. So either this is a very unusual type of UFO that kept coming back, or it was a permanent object that was there all the time. <coughs> so, what could give the appearance of a flashing light between the trees? Well, this was in, in fact the first part of the puzzle that I set out to solve. Uh, and it's probably the most controversial part, so I'll spend some time on it. Now, the day after the story hit the front page of the News of the World, this item appeared in the Times, written by one of their home affairs reporters, Alan Hamilton, who was a wonderful writer. Uh, this is the kind of thing that in the newspaper business they call a colour piece. And Alan Hamilton went to the forest and found a forester called Vince Thurkettle, who lived not far from where the landing site in the forest was supposed to have happened. And Vince expressed a certain scepticism, but he didn't at that time offer any explanation. Now I checked back in my diary and I found that on that Monday I, I went to Jodrell Bank to interview the SETI researcher Jill Tarter, who as you may know is the, the role model for the Jodie Foster character in Contact. So it was really rather a, a very E.T. wink for me. And it wasn't until a couple of days later uh, that I got around to phoning Vince to ask him what he thought the light could have been. And he'd clearly been giving it some thought in the meantime, for he said to me, do you really want to know or are you just a journalist looking for a story? And I said, yes, yeah, I, I really would like to know. And he said, I think it's the lighthouse. <laughs> this is the man who lived on the spot, he knew the air. He said, I think it's the lighthouse. And I nearly fell off my chair. 
because no one had mentioned anything about a lighthouse before. The news of the world had investigated this, Jenny Randall's investigated this, none of them had mentioned a lighthouse. So I thought, well, I really have to see this for myself. So I ordered up a film crew. Um, this was in the early days of breakfast television, and you can actually do that, and you do that now. Um, and off we went to Rendlesham Forest that night, and we filmed Vince in the forest with the lighthouse flashing behind him. And this is the clip, or an edited version of the clip that was broadcast the following morning. It appeared to them to move along at ground level, never going very high. Behind me was a standing tree crop. As they moved through the crop, the light would appear to move away in front of them at ground level. Well, I can tell you that although it's over five miles away, in the dark it appears much, much closer. And it's quite startling if you don't know what it is. I mean, you don't expect to come across a lighthouse in the forest. Now, as you can imagine, the UFO believers were furious about this. Uh, and I was attacked from two opposite directions. Now, one side said, you can't see the lighthouse from the forest, oblivious to the video evidence and never having been there to see for themselves. <coughs> While the other group said, oh, well, the security guards wouldn't be fooled by the lighthouse because you could see it all the time and they knew all about it. But in fact, that's not true either. You can't see the lighthouse directly from Eastgate because there's a forest in the way. And although sometimes you can see its beam reflecting off clouds and mist above the trees, but to see it directly, like on the film there, you have to get some way into the forest, and none of the men involved had been out there at night before. This was unknown territory to them. Well, let's go back to the police. Um, as we saw, they were called out on that first night, so what did they think it was? Well, they said that all they could see was the lighthouse. <laughs> And I think it's pretty clear that's what they thought it was uh, that the Air Force blokes had seen. But this particular piece of information never got passed on to Colonel Holt. And I've often wondered how differently this case might have turned out if Holt had been told what the police said about the lighthouse. So we had the local forester and the local police both saying it was only the lighthouse. And they knew the area far better than the US Air Force. And so to me, that was pretty persuasive, although not everyone agreed at the time. Now, over a decade later, a Scottish researcher called James Easton came up with some very valuable additional evidence, which I don't think he's ever received full credit. He contacted an organization called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy in America to see what they had on the case. And he found that they had the original statements made by the witnesses themselves describing the first night sighting in the forest. They made these statements for Colonel Holt, and for some reason, or to pass them on to this organization that's supposedly dedicated to combating UFO secrecy, um, and the documents have lain unknown in their files for years. And I think there's an irony there somewhere. And from these statements, we can learn a great deal more about what these witnesses saw and did on that first night. And I have to say that some of their stories have changed quite a bit since then, and you'll have to decide for yourselves whether you prefer to trust what they said at the time, or the statements they made for the media more recently. <laughs> now, one of the witnesses, Jim Penniston, very helpfully drew a map to show the route they'd taken into the forest, and I've plotted what he drew on this Google Earth view. And they drove out through East Gate and along the access road, and then took a narrow little gap between the trees, which is only grown now, until they had to stop. And from there, they proceeded on foot, heading east, off to the right here. And that's the direction the Orford Ness Lighthouse lies the coast. Now we know from forestry records that this area in the white box here had been newly planted five or six years before, so the trees were only about five or six feet high, and the blokes could see over them to the taller trees to the east. And this is Penniston's written statement, and it says, upon arriving at East Gate, directly to the east, about one and a half miles, in a large wooded area, a yellow glowing light was emitting above the trees. Now, the phrasing's a bit confusing, but it does seem to confirm that what they were seeing was well over to the far side of the forest, well away from East Gate. And this is pretty much confirmed by another of the men, Ed Cavansay, who went into the woods also that first night. And he said, we figured the lights were coming from past the forest, since nothing was visible when we passed through the woody forest. We would see a glowing near the beacon light, but as we got closer, 
we found it to be a lit up farmhouse. And then he comes to the crunch. We got to a vantage point where we could determine that what we were chasing was only a beacon light off in the distance. So not a UFO at all, only what he called a beacon light in the distance. And the third member of the party, John Burroughs, is the most specific of all. He says, we got up to a fence that separated the trees from the open field. And you can see the lights down by a farmer's house. Now remember that, because we'll come back to that again when we talk about the sightings on the third night. Lights down by a farmer's house. And then he says, once we reached the farmer's house, we could see a beacon going around, so we went towards it. And we followed it for about two miles before we could see it was coming from a lighthouse. <laughs> now, people often say they wouldn't have made a mistake like that. They knew the lighthouse. No, they didn't. <coughs> there it is, in their own words. They chased the lighthouse. Now, James Easton, who had originally started out as a believer, completely changed his mind as a result of these statements. And he became an even bigger proponent of the lighthouse explanation than I was. Even Jenny Randalls, who by this time had written two books on the case, finally lost her faith and decided that no genuine UFO had been involved at Rendlesham after all. Well, that was 1997, and you might have thought that the case was effectively dead. However, since then, something quite unexpected has come up. James Penniston, one of those witnesses on the first night, underwent regression hypnosis in 1994, and after that, he started telling a story about encountering a landed craft in the forest. Now, this was completely at odds with all the statements made at the time. What they said in their statements, and what everyone who was listening over the radio actually heard, was that they kept moving towards something that seemed to move away from them until they came out of the forest on the far side. But now, after this hypnosis, we had Penniston claiming he had encountered a landed craft in the forest and had examined it closely for 45 minutes. And it was about five years ago that Penniston started showing this notebook on TV programs. And he claimed that he'd walked around the craft and touched it and saw symbols on the side and he'd made notes as he did so in this book. Now this is a screen grab taken from one of those TV shows and I'm sorry it doesn't show up very well, but he's written the date and time at the top of the page and what he's written is December the 27th and the time of 12.30, by which I take it he means half past midnight. But this wasn't when it happened. We know from all other sources, including the police logs, that he was out there sometime after 3 a.m. on December the 26th. He's got the date and time wrong. So right away we have reason to doubt that these notes are genuine. And he also claims that the encounter took place on the side of the forest nearest to East Gate which contradicts the written statement he made at the time about driving into the forest and walking east. Now, as far as I'm aware, none of these TV programmes that have filmed him describing his encounter have ever tested this notebook forensically to see whether it was written when he said it was. But uh, given that it's at odds with everything else we know about the case, I doubt that it's genuine. And what makes his story even more unusual is that he says he received telepathic messages from the occupants of this craft who told him they were time travellers from our future who had come back to gather genetic samples to help them survive. So I think you can tell there's, there's much more of a mystical element now coming into this story from Penniston. And, and Penniston is trying to position himself as a contactee, although not as a contactee with ETs, but time travellers from the future, our distant descendants, thousands of years in the future. Well, let's go back to 1980 and the morning after that first sighting. You know, once it got light, some people from the airbase went out into the forest, and I don't know how they did this, but they found an area they thought could have been a landing site in a little clearing between the trees somewhere near the eastern side of the forest. And I marked it in this aerial view here. So this is getting better. We've not only got an unidentified light in the sky, one between the trees, we've now got physical traces on the ground. And they called the local police out again to have a look. Now, Georgina Bruni did an absolutely superb piece of research here in tracking down a photograph of this site. And here it is, with credit to Georgina. Now, it's been enlarged from a, a battered old contact print, so the quality isn't very good. But you can see the British Bobby up the top there, and the American Airman on the right. 
And you can see daylight between the trees in the distance, so we know we're not very far from the edge of the forest. Now what made the airmen think it was a landing site is that they found a triangle of markings on the ground, which they thought might have been made by the landing gear. They marked each of these with a stick, and uh, I'll pick them out for you here. Now, how any physical craft with feet that far apart is supposed to move between trees that close together, I don't know, but that's what some people apparently believe. Now, the policeman who saw these marks wasn't at all impressed, and in his report, he said that they looked like they'd been made by animals, such as rabbits. And the contact prints uh, also included some cut close-ups of the marks themselves. And I've circled them here. And I think you can see that they're not very impressive at all. So, do they look like rabbit diggings, or do they look like the footprints of an alien craft? Well, I don't, haven't got any pictures of the footprints of an alien craft, but I do have some <laughs> pictures of uh, rabbit diggings in Rebels from Forest. Uh, and I don't know about you, but to me, they look pretty much like the mark the security guards found. But the guards also found something else. They found what they thought were burn marks on the trees all around the supposed landing site. And again, Vince, the forester was able to tell me what these were. These were actually axe cuts that the foresters had made on the trees to indicate that they were ready for chopping down. And indeed, those trees were cut down not long after the event. Uh, I photographed some similar marks on some remaining trees in 1983, which is what you see here. So here we had the security guards finding perfectly mundane things in the forest and interpreting them uh, in terms of, of a UFO landing. In fact, there was nothing inexplicable about these marks at all. Now the next bit is one of the most contentious and difficult to understand, and it's the radiation readings. Now Nick Pope thinks this is the most significant evidence that something unusual happened at Rendlesham, even though he doesn't actually know anything about radiation, um, so we'll see if he's right. Now I mentioned that there were sightings in the woods again on the two nights following the initial incident, and on the third night some people from the airbase decided to do something about it. A young lieutenant called Bruce England went back to the base and told Holt that the UFO was back. And as Holt tells it, he was delegated by his boss, Colonel Conrad, to go out and investigate, even though this was on British soil, and he really shouldn't have been out there at all. And he picked a few men to go with him, and they took a night vision scope, called a starlight scope, and a Geiger counter, which was a standard Air Force model known as an ANPDR-27, like this one. And I asked Holt why he took a Geiger counter and he said that he hoped to prove that there wasn't any unusual radiation out there and that there wasn't anything to worry about. And indeed, that's what he did prove, although there are some people who would like you to believe otherwise. Now let's remind ourselves where this was. Uh, from what Holt tells us, the site he went to was over there on the eastern side of the forest with an open field just beyond it. Now you might know about Holt's famous tape recording, and he made that with his handheld dictaphone while he was investigating this site. So we can actually listen in on a UFO sighting as it develops. And we can use this tape as a truth test to compare what actually happened with what Holt now says happened. And there are some big differences. I'll play you a few excerpts. Um, this is how it starts as Holt approaches the site. Sorry, this is a terrible redubbing, uh, but it's, it's the best we've got. Um, so they're not picking up anything of significance, just what they call minor clicks. And we hear them checking each of the landing marks, and they still don't get anything more than three or four clicks on the meter. But after a few minutes of casting around and not finding anything, this happens. They've just had a peak reading of what they call seven tenths. Now note that this isn't a steady reading, uh, it's just a sudden spike. And that's the highest reading they got, as far as we can tell from the tape. Okay, so what does that mean, if anything? Well, this is the dial of the meter they were using. Now you'll notice from the knob at the top left that there are four scales, depending 
how strong the radiation is you're trying to measure. And they're labeled 500, 50, 5, and 0.5. And they were on the 0.5 scale, which is the very lowest scale for the smallest amount of radiation. And for most of the time, they were getting what they call minor clicks, just three or four clicks on the meter, as we've heard. And here it is, marked on the scale. It's at the very bottom end of the most sensitive scale. They were hardly picking up anything at all. In fact, this type of meter wasn't designed for picking up everyday levels of radiation, so it's barely registering. And they got these same levels, not just around the supposed landing site, but over the whole surrounding area, including out in the fields to the east as well. So this was just background radiation. And even the peak reading, 7 tenths, was only twice that. And as I've said, that was just a random spike that could have been caused by natural radiation from the ground or a cosmic ray. I don't know. So there was absolutely nothing unusual about the radiation levels at the site at all. It was just background. And anyone who claims otherwise is just misrepresenting the data. And it was while all this was going on that uh, Lieutenant England saw a light between the trees and he drew it the whole attention. And this is what we hear on the tape. Clear off to the coast. 
on the horizon. What lies on the coast of flashes? <laughs> I know for years Holt's been saying that it couldn't have been the lighthouse because the lighthouse was in the southeast, 30 to 40 degrees off to the right. But it isn't. Go back to this picture from where they were standing. The lighthouse was right across the field in front of them. That's the east, not the southeast. So from his own words, Holt tells us that the flashing light lay in the same direction as the Orford Ness Lighthouse, it flashed at the same rate as the Orford Ness Lighthouse, and he even described it as lying off to the coast. But he didn't recognize it because, as he tells us, he thought the lighthouse was in a different direction. So putting all that together, I think we can conclude that the radiation readings were of no significance and that the flashing light that Paul saw was indeed the lighthouse, and it was the same as the light that the men saw on the first night, which of course they actually identified as the lighthouse. So now we come to the final point, which I think is the most fascinating of all, and that's the star-like objects that hovered for several hours uh, and seemed to dance and twinkle. And this is of particular interest because it's the part of Holt's story that has, given, uh, that has grown the most uh, over the years. And the way he describes them now, they sound utterly inexplicable, but if you go back to the tape, it sounds like a simple misidentification of celestial objects. And we know from many years of experience that celestial objects are the most common cause of UFO sightings, even from police and pilots. And in his memo, uh, Holt talks about seeing three star-like objects all about 10 degrees off the horizon. And they moved with sharp, angular movements and displayed red, green, and blue lights and remained in the sky for up to three hours. And he says that the one in the south beamed down a stream of light from time to time. Now, any UFO investigator worth their salt would immediately suspect that these were simply celestial objects twinkling close to the horizon. And it wouldn't be very difficult to surmise that the most prominent one in the south was actually Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. However, there's a fair bit more about these starlight objects on the tape, so I'll go through that and I'll also explain how Holt has since elaborated his descriptions of these objects to what I think is the point of fantasy. So this is how he first reports them. Okay, so he's describing these objects as appearing to move away. 
and finally the one in the south sending down beams to the ground. Well, needless to say, I don't think there was any real movement going on at all. What I think they were seeing was changes in brightness, which they interpreted as movement towards and away from them. Now, imagine you're looking at a light and it starts to get fainter. Uh, you might easily imagine it was moving away. And if it got brighter, you might think it was coming towards you. And slight changes in brightness of stars can easily be caused by thin clouds moving across in front of them. And, and again, this is quite well known from other reports of misperceived celestial objects. But what about that beam? <coughs> well, bright objects cause dazzle in the eye. Uh, there's a famous case from 1967 where two Devon policemen chased a flying cross, uh, which was in fact Venus. But being so bright, it looked as though there were beams coming out of it. In fact, if any of you have seen Jupiter in, in the evening sky at, at the moment, that, that also is very bright. And, um, if your eyes are as bad as mine, it looks as though there are beams coming out of it. So I've already said that, in my opinion, the object that Holt saw in the south was Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. And I think that a combination of dazzle in the eye and twinkling in the atmosphere can account for what Holt saw. However, you wouldn't think that if you listen to the tales he now tells it. Because this is a part of the story that has grown hugely. As he now tells it, this object moved right over them and shot down a beam of light a foot wide, almost to their feet. Now that sounds alarming. You'd think there would be something about that on the tape, wouldn't you? But there isn't. Yes, he does talk on the tape uh, about an object sending down beams, as we've just heard, but on the tape he only ever describes this object as being low on the horizon, not overhead. And he says nothing about the beams coming anywhere near him. There are some beautiful TV reconstructions of a shaft of light coming down like something out of Close Encounters, but they're all fiction. Now something else he now says is that some of the beams from these objects in the sky came down in the area of Bentwaters to the north, where the nukes were stored. But one of the guards there at the time has now come forward and said that no such beams were there. And you can imagine if they had come down, if some unknown craft really was overflying their nuclear storage area and scanning it with laser beams, there should have been the most fearsome alert. But there wasn't. So it seems to me that Holt is spinning a yarn about all this. And if you go back and listen to the tape, you can tell how his story has grown out of all proportion. And as I've said, this tape is a truth test. And much of what Holt now says fails that test. So the final question you might be wondering is, what did Holt do about this apparent incursion of unknown craft into his airspace? Well, interviewer Sally Rail asked him this when she interviewed him back in 1994. And he told her that he got central security control to call, to call Eastern Radar uh, and their RAF Watton in Norfolk, and they're responsible for air defence in that region. And twice the radar operators reported they didn't see anything. And we know this is true because there's a record of that call, and Dave Clark has spoken, we'll be here tomorrow, Dave Clark has spoken to the person on duty at the radar station <coughs> at the time. So there were people actually watching radar screens while all this was going on, actually looking out for these things that Holt was reporting, but they saw nothing. And Dave Clark will tell you more about that in his own presentation tomorrow, but it seems the story that there were radar sightings is just another part of the Rendlesham myth. And after that, he turned around and went home. <laughs> this is the very last part of the tape.
So I think we can finally fill in the answer to our last question about what the star-like objects were. And that wraps up what some people would have you believe is one of the greatest UFO visitations to planet Earth in our time. And I hope by going through the points listed here, I've been able to show you that there's nothing truly inexplicable or anomalous about any of the main aspects of the Redfern Forest case, at least if you know the kind of mistakes that people commonly make in UFO sightings. So in my view, this whole case can be seen as a series of simple mistakes by the United States Air Force, although fortunately not in the same league as the friendly fire incidents when they actually killed people. And since the story became public knowledge, it's been kept alive by those witnesses who think it's less embarrassing to claim they had a UFO encounter than to admit that they made a mistake. And I've only been able to give you an outline here, of course, but there's plenty more detail on my website which I invite you to take a look at. And uh, David, if there's time, uh, I'll, I'll take questions. And tomorrow morning, Dave Clark will tell you what he found in the Ministry of Defence files on the case and how that relates to the overall explanation.